Good morning, Forward. It is great to see you this morning, and uh, thank you for entering into worship like you just did. It's just always beautiful to listen to you uh, worshiping Jesus together. Uh, I just want to say a couple things before we get into the message today. First of all, I just want to say thank you from, uh, on behalf of myself and my family. A few weeks ago, my mom passed away, and so many of you have uh, just shown such overwhelming love and encouragement and support to our family. And I couldn't think of a better way to be able to uh, say thank you to everybody who helped out and just showed love to us uh, than just to do that this morning. So thank you so much for caring for us well over the last few weeks. And second, I have the privilege of welcoming some new members to our church family today. So would you join me in welcoming Shane and Kelly Huseman officially as members of the Forward family? If you are uh, considering Forward to be your church home and you've been with us for a little bit and you go, hey, this is my home, and you're not a member yet, I want to encourage you. Membership is such a great way to commit yourself to this family of believers, to be able to say, hey, we're in this together, we're a family, we're supporting each other, we're on the same mission together as a church. And so if you want more information about membership here at Forward, just uh, text in the word member to our text line and it'll send you a link with some more information about what it means to be a member of our church. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. If you have ever been to a counselor, there is a very good chance that one of the things they've spoken to you about is your personal values. Whether you can verbalize them or not, your values are always the things that are at the root of the decisions you make in life. You do what you do because of what you value in life. For example, let's just theoretically say that you are a fan of a sports team that hasn't won anything in a decade or six. What is it that keeps you loving that sports team? You're either dumb or you have a core value of loyalty. And since I believe in you, I think that you have a core value of loyalty. But loyalty is one of those things that drives a lot of people in different ways. Like people with a core value of loyalty, uh, uh, for instance, if you've got a new job opportunity, but you're like hesitant to say yes to that new job opportunity that's come along because it's going to mean I have to move away from my friends and my family or I really like the co-workers that I'm with. You, you, your core value of loyalty keeps you in that job. Uh, loyalty shows up in the way we make decisions in relationships or the way we make decisions about money. Uh, but loyalty is not the only core value we have. Lots of people have different values and at the root of why you do what you do are your values. But values aren't only the thing that drives what you do, why, why you do what you do. Values also motivate you to become someone that you're not today. For example, let's say you're someone who has social anxiety. It, you have a hard time just being around other people, being in the presence of other people for whatever reasons. You just have a difficult time with it. Well, one of the values, if one of, if one of your values is, man, I really want to have close friendships with other people. I value friendships. I value relationships. Well, that value of friendship and relationship can become a motivator in your life that is going to take you out of your fear and help you overcome your fear so that you can put yourself in environments to build relationship and friendship with other people. Values both determine why you do what you do and motivate you to do things that you want to become and grow in in life. Not only do you have personal values, but your family has values as well. If you value time together as a family, if that's one of your personal values, then you're going to make sure you put things into your life to, to ensure that you spend time together as a family. It's why you schedule family vacations together. It's why you make sure you're eating dinner together. Whatever that looks like in your home, you have family values as well. Well, just like you have personal values and your family has a set of values, uh, Forward as a church also has a set of values. And for the next few weeks, we are going to dive into those core values of what is it that makes forward, forward? Values in a church are a lot like values when it comes to a family. They, they work best when everyone 
is living out of these values. When we say, hey, yeah, like, this is who we are, this is how we function, how we operate, what motivates us, what drives us. And, and, and so I don't want you to see this as a, a series of messages talking about Forward Church, the organization, and what our core values are. I want you to see this as what we value together as a church family. What is it that makes us, us? And so I want to bring you to Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, to start us today. Here's what God's word says. He, meaning Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The very first value that we have as a church is that we are a church that is led by Jesus. This is the value that trumps all other values. If there is ever any conflict or debate about anything, we come and bring ourselves back to this value. We are a church that is led by Jesus. There, there are a lot of reasons why people go to church. People go to church to find friendships. People go to church to be encouraged, to find peace in the midst of chaos in their lives. People go to church for their kids or their grandkids to have a little bit of religion in life. But the one thing that separates the church from any other club or any other organization or religion is Jesus. Now, if you're brand new to church or to Christianity, this might sound really strange to you. But a man who lived 2,000 years ago has changed our lives. He, he taught things that even today are revolutionary. He focused on love. He healed people. He cared for the people who were on the margins. But, but the Bible teaches us that Jesus was far more than a historical figure. And Jesus was far more than a good moral teacher. Look back at verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is an exact replica of God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. He is God in the flesh. He is the evidence that God is for us. He is the evidence that you don't have to work your way to God, that God came to dwell amongst us us as humans. He became human in order to experience all the things that we experience and to be our representative here on this earth. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then it says in verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. I want you to think about that for a second. You exist because of Jesus. Not because your mom and dad were having a good night. You exist because of Jesus. The very fact that you woke up this morning and took breath in your lungs is because of Jesus. Everything that exists exists because of him. Your favorite vacation spot? Jesus. Your dream vacation that you want to go on? exist because of Jesus. The moon and Mars that we are spending billions of dollars on as humanity to try to figure out how do we get people to the moon and how do we get people to Mars, all of those things exist because of Jesus. The North Star that's 323 light years away from this planet, Jesus, all of it exists because of Jesus. But not only did he create everything, he holds everything together. That's what these verses tell us. If you want to know why the, you think the world's in chaos now, take Jesus out of the equation and imagine the kind of chaos the world would, have, would live in. Everything that exists, the fact that our planet can spin around on its axis in the middle of all the blackness of space without turning into chaos is Jesus. He holds all things together in his hands. I want you to think about the most spectacular thing you have ever seen or experienced. When you see something spectacular, what is your natural response? I, I know for me and most people, you just have to like stop and soak it in. You're 
in awe of the beauty of something. We, we are naturally drawn as people to things that are beautiful and things that are powerful. They, they capture our imagination as people. It, it could be a vacation in the mountains somewhere. It could be watching a, a rocket launch somewhere. It, it could be a work of art or seeing a flower bloom or a bird up in the sky. It could be a video that you're watching where somebody's doing something that you know never in a million years could I do that. Whatever it is, those things that are spectacular to you make you stop. Of all the busyness and all the, all the things and tasks that you have to do in life, those things make you stop and consider how amazing that is. But I want you to know that there is nothing and nobody more spectacular, more overwhelmingly good than Jesus. Jesus is the entire point of church. He is why we are here. And, and, and I know, because I grew up going to church, I know that you can go to church your entire life and you can miss this point. Because you can get caught up and focused on well, what are all the things I have to do? What are all the rules of being a Christian? You can get caught up and focused on the relational dynamics that happen in church. Sometimes we all like each other. Sometimes we don't like each other as much. And we can get caught up in all those kinds of dynamics. And when you get caught up in all those things, it's so easy to lose sight of the reality that what all of this is about and why all of this exists that you are in this room for is one person. It's for Jesus. All of it exists because of Jesus. Jesus is the main attraction. Jesus is the reason we exist as a church. And because Jesus is so overwhelmingly good and glorious. We can't help but want to be a church that's led by Jesus. Now, I know that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've probably heard this phrase many, many times over. Jesus is the head of the church. So today what I want to do in the time we have left is I want to unpack what does that mean that Jesus is the head of the church? Like we read in verse 18. What, what does that actually look like tangibly? Well, the first thing I want you to see is jump down to verse 19. I'm going to read some verses for you. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The first thing you need to see about what does it look like for Jesus to be the head of the church, for Jesus to lead the church, a church led by Jesus is a church where Jesus is the source of life. Now, let me give you some context in Colossians. There's a group of people, there's a teaching that's happening in the church at that time where uh, people were saying, hey, you, you need to have deeper spiritual experiences and you're going to have deeper spiritual experiences and protection spiritually if you just practice these certain rites and rituals that are going on. So, so let us help you have a deeper experience with God. And, and while some people are arguing all around them that ultimate spiritual experience could be found in places in addition to Christ, Paul, at the very beginning of this letter, is holding up Jesus as the one who is the true and only source of life for us. Paul shows this comparison, I don't know if you noticed it, between who you used to be and who you are because of Jesus. He says things like, you were alienated. That every human being was made for fellowship and relationship with God. But because of your sin, because of your failure to obey God and surrender to God in all of life, you are alienated from God. You are alienated from that fellowship and that relationship that you were created to have with God. And he says, you were hostile in mind. That, that you were not neutral towards God. You, you lived your life you, like you didn't really need God. I can do things my own way. I don't need God. Your thoughts are not for God and towards him. 
We live like we can figure everything out on our own. And then he goes one, one step further and he says, you are even doing evil deeds. You do things naturally that run against what God calls good. So if you had a relationship with someone who was doing things to you that was harmful and was evil, if you had a relationship with someone who was outright sinning against you and treating you like garbage, who was hostile towards you, how would you ever be able to reconcile that relationship? What do you do when things are that broken? When things are that messed up? Well, many times as humans, one of the things we do is we will call in a mediator. We call in someone to come and be a third party to help reconcile the relationship, to help deal with all of the brokenness and all the messiness of the relationship. If you've ever been in business and, and you've been negotiating a collective bargaining agreement with someone, you know that you get into these debates and arguments between two sides. And they call in a mediator to be the middle person to negotiate the contract between each side. And when that mediator steps in and negotiates that contract, or when that mediator steps into your relationship with that other person, they come up with some rules and they come up with a way to be able to reconcile the relationship. But there's a limitation on every human mediator and it's this. It's only as good as the next contract lasts. If you are in collective bargaining in business or in, if you've seen it in sports, you know, it's great. Hey, yeah, we've, we've come up with a contract, but it's good for three years. And then we're going to be right back where we were three years ago. Having this exact same debate. But Jesus steps in, and Jesus is sent by God to be your mediator to reconcile your relationship with God. And when that word reconcile shows up in Colossians chapter 1, it carries this idea with it, that Jesus steps in, and he, his work of reconciliation is done. There is no contract that needs to be reopened. It is a once and for all agreement. Jesus is the one who makes it possible for you and I to be reconciled to God. It's over. It's finished through what he did on the cross. He steps in to make things right between us. And the reconciliation that you receive is full. God moves from being your enemy to being your father and your friend. God's heart is to reconcile, not to reject. You have eternal life because Jesus is the source of that eternal life. But Jesus is not only the source of that eternal life, your entire life is sustained by Jesus. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. You are more loved by Jesus than you can imagine. In the world that we live in today, people will tell you, do whatever you need to do in order to make yourself happy. So let me ask you, why are we more stressed and more anxious than ever before? If we're all doing what makes us happy, why are we more stressed and anxious than we've ever been? Because nothing you and I is ever going to do will ever fully satisfy us. Jesus is the bread of life. Do you, do you want to know why we encourage you to read your Bible and pray as a church? Because Jesus is the source of your life. He's going to nourish you. He's going to show you how much he cherishes you. And you're going to experience his love day in and day out. Think about last week and the time we spent in prayer together as a church. Why did we do that? We did that because it was an opportunity for us to acknowledge as a church that Jesus is the source of our life. That there is nothing we can do as a church that matters unless Jesus is in it. See, the Christian life is not a whole bunch of programs and activities and weekly church services to attend and busyness and busyness. It's a life staying connected with Jesus. Every program and every ministry in this church is a means to an end, but they're not the end. The goal is Jesus, that we see Jesus as the source of our life. And that's why we take some time 
for communion on a regular basis. And I'm going to ask you, in the middle of this message, we're going to stop and we're going to have communion together. So if you would pull out your communion cups. Communion is a time for God's people to come together. I don't know about you, but September is such a busy, busy time for most people I know, including me. And sometimes it's hard to keep everything straight in the midst of all the busyness that's going on. And communion is a great gift to us to recenter us, to bring us back to the reality that Jesus is the source of our life. That Jesus is why all of this exists. So I want to invite you, if you need a communion cup, just raise your hand. We have a couple people who are uh, looking around to uh, make sure that you do receive one. You can pull out the wafer. This represents, this wafer represents the bread represents the reality that Jesus, the Son of God, became a human. And he took responsibility on his own shoulders for the things that were keeping you separated from God. Think about that. Think about what mediator would ever do that. In any mediation, what mediator would step in and go, I will take the full weight of everything that's broken in this relationship so that the two of you can be reconciled to each other. And that's what Jesus did for us. So I invite you to take this wafer now and eat it in remembrance of the body of Jesus that was given for you. And then open up the juice. The juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. In the Old Testament, whenever blood was shed, it signaled that a life had been given and a life had been sacrificed. That your sin and my sin deserves death. But the blood of Jesus presents you holy before God and makes it possible for you to even be reconciled to God. So we take this juice in remembrance of the life of Jesus that was given for us. Father, I pray in this moment that by the power of your Spirit, you would help us in our hearts and our minds to once again have just a glimpse, a taste of how good and glorious Jesus is. Forgive us for all the ways that we go to other things to be a source of life. Help us, God, to be grounded in the truth that Jesus is the source of our life. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Not only is Jesus the source of life, but the verse we read in verse 18 earlier tells us that Jesus is above everything else in life. He is preeminent, it says at the end of verse 18. A, a church led by Jesus is a church where Jesus is king of that church. You know, politics are fascinating to me. Maybe I'm twisted like that. But uh, politics... It, is all about power, ultimately. Who, who's going to have power to rule and lead a country? And so we spend a lot of time as citizens debating politics and deciding which leader is going to be the best one to rule and lead a country. But in the church, there is no debate who the ruler and leader is. There is only one leader, and his name is Jesus. But when it comes to making decisions, the final authority here at Forward is not myself or Pastor Derek. The final authority is not the board of elders in this church. The final authority is not even you as members of this church. The final authority for this church is Jesus. He is king. And 
and I am grateful that you like us, but I want you to love him. Like, we must decrease, Jesus must increase. Have you ever noticed that in politics, though, we, we vote for the leaders who are going to do the things that we want them to do? Which means, at the heart of it, when it comes to politics, we're really the ones who are looking for power. You'll have my vote. I think you'll be a good leader because you're going to do the things I want you to do in politics. We're the ones who are looking for power. And that same desire for power spills over into our spiritual lives all the time. We sing songs about Jesus being the king of our lives, but that is not exactly the same as Jesus actually being the king of our lives. It's very different. So in Colossians chapter 1, we're going to get an idea of what does it look like to have Jesus be the sovereign ruler of our lives. Look at verse 24. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Verse 24 is written in a bit of a strange way. After Paul spent all this time talking about how great Jesus is and how uh, Jesus is the one who created everything and holds everything together, in verse 24, he writes these words that says, yeah, I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. And you go, wait a minute, if Jesus is so great, what is lacking in Jesus. Like, what's the missing point here? Where's the disconnect here? It almost sounds like Paul's saying in verse 24, Jesus isn't really enough. I've got to do more. But I want you to look a little bit deeper at those verses, because what Paul's describing is God has given to him a responsibility, and the responsibility is make the Word of God fully known. So what Paul's talking about is there's like this gap. There's the gap that exists between the present reach of the gospel, and what was going to be required to get the gospel to everybody else. That God had given to Paul, as a disciple of Jesus, a responsibility. And this gap that exists was going to require suffering to take place so that the mission could go forward. That Christ's afflictions paid the price for our sin, but not everyone knows of God's grace. And so what Paul is talking about here is there's a reason why he rejoices in his suffering because his suffering is the way that was required for the mission of Jesus to be able to go forward. Here's what that means for us in terms of Jesus being the head of our church, Jesus leading us as a church. We show that we are led by Jesus when Jesus is the one who determines our mission. If Jesus is leading the church then Jesus is the one who gets to define why we exist and what success looks like in the church. For for the longest time, Christians in North America, and maybe in other parts of the world too, but certainly in North America, we've defined success in these terms. How many people showed up for church on Sunday? How many programs is the church running? And we say, man, that's a sign that the church is successful. But success in church is not based on how many people are in a room on Sunday. It's not based on how many programs you're running. It's not even based on whether or not you feel comfortable and have great friendships with other people in church. Those things are all nice to have. They're all good. They're all important parts of church life. But if Jesus is leading our church, then Jesus determines our mission, and he's already told us what the mission is. It is to go into all the world and make more disciples of Jesus. That is why we exist. Now, you might say, well, of course that's true. I know that that's what he wants. But I've been around church long enough to know that we don't always live like we want that to be true in churches. See, it's easy for us to say that we need to be serious about the mission of Jesus, but then we make other things in church other priorities than that. It's called mission drift. It's the small steps and little things that we do along the way that take us away from the core of who we're supposed to be, 
as a body of Christians, as a group of believers in Jesus. In 1636, there was a university that was founded with exclusively Christian professors in it. It was considered one of the highest education places in North America. They emphasized character formation above all else. And they placed a strong emphasis on equipping people to share the good news of Jesus wherever they went for their careers. Every diploma, if you are a graduate of this school, every diploma read this, Truth for Christ and the Church. Today, if you were to go to the website of this university, you would read this as their purpose. To educate citizens and citizen leaders for our society. We do this through a commitment to the transformative power of liberal arts and sciences education. The school, Harvard University. Founded for the purpose of the mission of Jesus. But over the course of its history, little steps, little steps, didn't seem like too big of a deal at the time. Small decisions that get made that over the course of decades and centuries turn into a school that went from relying on the power of Jesus to the power of social sciences and, and education. And it can happen to any of us. We can all rationalize all kinds of things as little steps to take in our lives that are good things, nothing bad necessarily about it, but they take us off the core of who we were meant to be. And a church that is led by Jesus is going to understand that at the core, its mission is to make more disciples of Jesus, to bring the gospel to people who don't know Jesus, and to take the people who already do know Jesus and say, we have to keep growing deeper in Jesus and keep being more serious about following Jesus with our lives. When we make decisions as a church, pursuing the mission of Jesus over our own comfort is a sign that we are truly allowing Jesus to be the one that leads our church. So Jesus determines our mission, but that's not the only thing he determines. He also determines our message. Look at verse 27. Paul says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, mourning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. When Jesus is leading the church, then Jesus will be the message of the church. I, I don't know if you've figured this out yet. I was joking with someone a few weeks ago, and I said, you know, secret behind the scenes of pastors, we actually only have one message. His name's Jesus. We, we, there's dozens and hundreds of ways to present the message, but there is one message that we have. It's Jesus. We will keep calling people to Jesus. At the core of everything we say and do, there is only one story that matters, only one truth that matters, only one way that matters. It's Jesus. And here's what I know about Jesus. Jesus is going to both comfort you and Jesus is going to challenge you because he is full of grace and he is full of truth. If you are tired and you are burned out on life, Jesus is where you're going to find rest for your soul. If you're overwhelmed by the sin in your life and the shame of all of your mistakes, Jesus is where you are going to find forgiveness and the ability to be made whole as a person. But Jesus is going to make you feel uncomfortable at times, too. This is the guy who got angry at injustice, who called out people for being hypocrites, who hung out with people that nobody else wanted to be around, told people to love their enemies of all things. He's going to make you feel comfortable or uncomfortable. I know that as people, we want to be affirmed on whatever is going to make me happy. I know that churches in our country and around the world right now are feeling pressure to only talk about feel-good sermons. But a church that is led by Jesus is both going to make sure that you understand how great God's riches are towards you. But at the same time, they're going to teach you and call you and warn you and invite you to follow Jesus. 
Why do we do this? It's not because of a bunch of religious rules that we do this. It's because we are convinced that Jesus is the only way for you to find eternal life, for you to find eternal satisfaction in your soul. It's one of the reasons why we talk about the Bible so much as a church, why we talk about discipleship so much. I I want you to know that we want you to encounter a God who loves you. But we also want you to know a God who loves you so much that he's willing to correct you. Jesus determines our mission and our message. And if we're a church that is led by Jesus, then Jesus is also going to determine our way of life. Look at verse 29. Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. But Paul finishes this whole section by saying, that presenting everybody mature in Christ is not something that's only for Sunday when he's preparing a sermon. That's the only time he thinks about it. That the mission and the message of Jesus is all-consuming to him. That all of his thoughts, all of his energy goes towards this whole thing of presenting people mature in Christ. The grace and power of, of God was so real in his own life, he needed everyone around him to experience it and know it as well. If Jesus is going to lead our church, then he can't only be our leader on Sunday morning. He has to be our leader through the whole week. When you and I go into our homes, when we go into our workplaces, to our schools, and into our neighborhoods, when we go to the hockey rink or swimming lessons or wherever life takes us through the week, we still need to be people who are being led by Jesus all the time. We need to be a people that wherever we go, people are experiencing the reality of Christ in us. I'm struck by how Paul describes this. He says, I toil and I struggle. You know, there's a lot of things that will capture your attention and your energy in the course of a week. A lot of things that want you to invest emotional, physical energy into it. And it's very easy to come and listen to a message and sing some great songs on Sunday morning and forget all about Jesus on Monday morning. And I'm telling you that as as your pastor, too. I face that reality. Because there's all kinds of pressures that come at you. But when you're led by Jesus, wherever you are in the course of your week, and whatever you are doing, Jesus will be at the center of it all. To be led by Jesus is a a seven-day-a-week reality. Now, let me just, I want to do a quick sidebar on this. If you're a parent who's here today, according to some studies recently, the average child attends church services for about half of a year. Roughly 24 hours of time is spent in the course of a year from a church teaching your child about how to follow Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. How much time do your kids spend with other things that are investing in their life and pointing them in other directions? The average child will have more media consumption in one week than they will church time in one year. And everything that's going into your child's mind and heart is shaping them in some way, shape, or form. If you are a person, a parent, who wants to be led by Jesus, then you need to take seriously the call of Jesus for discipleship, and it starts in your home. You need to find other ways and be intentional in other ways to invest in the lives of your kids beyond taking them to church. We're partners with you, but it can't end here. And I am incredibly concerned for the future of our kids and our youth if the only input spiritually they get is when they walk in the doors of the church building. If we really believe Jesus is the source of life, then we need to keep pointing everyone around us to Jesus being the source of life. 
And I know so many of you are doing that in so many different ways, and I love you and appreciate you for doing that. But if Jesus is king in your home, how is that shaping how you spend your time and your energy at home? See, following Jesus, it's not a program. It's not an event. Following Jesus is meant to be just an entire way of life. It's just who we are. It's what we do day in, day out. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. We all need to make this a way of life. It's one of the reasons why we keep talking to you about being serious about your discipleship. If you look in front of you, somewhere around you, there's a brochure for all of our fall ministries that are happening. And I want to invite you to pull that out. If you don't know, if you have not decided what steps you are going to take to keep growing as a disciple of Jesus, you need to make some of those decisions. Jesus is calling you. He's inviting you to follow him, but you need to take some intentional steps to do that. And that brochure gives a whole bunch of different ways for you to do that. I want to say thank you to some of you who have been really obedient in that. I, I know that last Sunday when we asked you to pray about this, there were a, a bunch of people who took that seriously. Here's how I know that. Because after the service, we had a huge surplus of people who signed up to join Freedom Session. I know that many of you are taking these steps seriously. Uh, but one of the things I want to invite everyone in this church to be a part of is a discipleship group. Because in a discipleship group, it goes beyond Sunday morning. You get to be in a small group with other people where you're going to build some friendships, but you're also going to challenge and help each other to grow as disciples of Jesus. That's what it's all about. If you're in a discipleship group right now and all you're doing is hanging out and building friendships with each other, kind of challenge each other this fall and say, hey, this is a space for us to help each other grow as disciples of Jesus. Let's, let's get serious about that together. If you're not in a discipleship group yet, just text the word disciple to the text number. It'll give you some information on how you can join one of our discipleship groups. Uh, I am encouraged because this reality of Jesus being the head of our church is happening. Over the last few weeks alone, I have interacted with people who are looking at ways of how do I share the good news of Jesus with my coworkers. I, I've, I've interacted with people who are seeing conflict in their in their families and in their marriages or other relationships. And they're saying, man, what does it look like for Jesus to be the king over our family? What does it look like for Jesus to be the king over our marriage? How do we surrender that to him? I, I, I've talked to people who are figuring out, hey, how do I be generous? I haven't given money to anything in forever. What does it mean for me to be generous and allow Jesus to be king over my wallet? I've talked to people who, who are being honest for the first time in their life and they're confessing sins to each other and praying for each other. I've seen people who are praying like never before. And I've been in rooms with people who are absolutely moved to tears because they look at a world around us that's falling apart and desperately needs Jesus. Jesus. I am so grateful for what God's doing in this church, for us to be a church that's led by Jesus, but we need to keep going in that direction. I'm so grateful to be part of a church where we're not perfect, but we do want Jesus to be more than a Sunday morning. We want Jesus to be the center of everything in our lives. And I want you to know something forward. I'm not saying this just because I'm one of your pastors. I've had the chance to be connected in my life in different ways with probably hundreds if not thousands of different churches in this country. What God is doing in this church is special. There are things that God is doing that is stirring up the hearts of people to create a greater love for God that is very special. But we need to make sure that we never, ever allow pride to creep in. We exist only because of Jesus. We can only do things we do because of Jesus. And we need every day, every week, every month, every year to live like we are a church that's led by Jesus. Let me pray. Father, 
Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who is the head of the church. God, I pray with all my heart you would take the weakness of my words this morning and your spirit would breathe life into our hearts and our minds. Help us, God, to be a people who don't just say Jesus is head of the church, but help us to live like we really mean it. Help us to live fully surrendered lives to you when we're together and when we are out in the world that you called us to be in. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship him.